Okay, guys, we're going to finish up chapter 6 today. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a short lesson. The topic is static electricity, which we all have some kind of experience with. Um, I know that you guys have, have, you know, drug your feet across the floor and shocked somebody before, right? Yeah. Hey, we're building up static electricity. So uh, that's what this lesson is going to be about. We're going to talk about how electrons move from one object to another, how the, there's a number of different ways that occurs. We're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about the physics of lightning, and then uh, we'll finish up explaining some of the different experiments that you can do with static electricity today after the video. So here we go. Before we start, have your guided notes out. This is chapter six guided notes, the very end of it. Let's go. Okay, so static electricity. You're supposed to write down the definition. Here it is. Static electricity is the buildup of charges on an object that occurs through induction. So static electricity is the buildup of charge. Static electricity is the buildup of charges on an object. We're going to talk about what induction is here in just a second, how you can build up a charge. But some examples of static electricity, like if you drag your shoes across the carpet, or we've all kind of done this before with a balloon, you rub it on your shirt, you can stick it on the wall, right? We've seen that and how that works. So there's a couple of examples. Well, like charges don't like to be by each other. A bunch of electrons, do they like to hang out by other electrons? No, no. like charges were repelled. And so when you build up that static electricity, if you get next to something else that has a different attraction for electrons, well, sometimes you'll see the electrons jump from one object to another object, and that's called static discharge. It's the sudden flow of electrons from one object to another one. You see a little, uh, little miniature lightning bolt right there, right? If you look carefully, you can see that when you shock somebody. And you'll see it today when we, when we uh, do our experiments. All right, well, there's a number of ways that electrons can go from one object to another. In fact, we're going to study three ways here today. The first one is called conduction. You're supposed to write that in your books. Okay? Conduction. It occurs when there's direct contact made between materials that differ in their ability to accept or give up electrons. So the thing that I would like you to remember is conduction occurs when there is direct contact. In another way of saying this is you've got to touch the other object. So maybe I would write that in the margins next to conduction. It means you have to physically touch the other object. Then the electrons can move from one object to another. All right, some examples of this. Touching the Van de Graaff generator, you'll do this today. Or even if you go and you shock somebody and you touch them, those electrons are being transferred from one person to another person. Okay, a second way electrons can move from one object to another is called polarization. Okay, polarization is kind of cool. It's moving of charges that occurs over a distance. So you don't actually have to physically touch somebody else. Polarization occurs over a distance. So contact is not required. We're going to experiment with this today. And you're going to have a balloon and you're going to move a soda can without even touching the soda can. You can move, you can move it. So, um, and that's polarization, the movement of charges over a distance. We'll explain that in just a bit. Okay, the last way that electrons can move from one object to another is one that we're all familiar with is friction. The rubbing of one object against another. For example, the rubbing of your shoes on the carpet. Another thing that works really well to build up static electricity is rubbing your shoes on the trampoline, right? The trampoline mat, it, it can build up quite a, quite a large charge there. So. Okay, so three ways. Conduction, polarization, and friction. What I've got next is a, a slide here. If I was to number these, so let's call this picture number one and this one two, and down here is three. Which one, guys, is polarization? 
two. How do you know? Yeah, it's not touching. These charges are, are moving over a distance, and so polarization is kind of cool. It works that way. What would number one be an example of? Conduction. Conduction. Yeah, this, uh, this girl is touching the Van de Graaff generator, and the charges are moving between them. Okay, and then number three, what is it? Yeah, friction. She's uh, rubbed her feet on the trampoline, and, and it's almost exactly like conduction here with the Van de Graaff generator. Guys, why does the hair stand up like that? Yeah, like charges don't like to be by each other, do they? So even individual strands, will, when they have like charges on them, will separate from each other. They don't want to be next to the other hair, hair there, so they um, stand apart like that. So that's what's happening. Okay, polarization, let me explain it. When you take a balloon today, you're going to have this balloon and you're going to move the soda can. How does it work? Well, when you take the balloon and rub it on your shirt, you're transferring a lot of electrons to the balloon. Okay, so now there's a buildup of negative charges on the balloon. Well, the can by itself is neutral. What does that mean? It means for every positive charge, there's a negative charge. For every positive charge, there's a negative charge. But what happens when you bring this balloon next to the can? These negative charges and these negative charges will do what? Repel. And so what it does is it moves these negative charges in the can over to the other side. They're trying to get away from the negative charges of the balloon. And so everything that's left here is just positive charges. Guys, which way is that can going to roll? Is it going to go away from the balloon? Or is it going to go toward the balloon? It's going to go toward the balloon. Why? Opposites attract. So now there's opposite charges here. You're going to roll that can toward the balloon. And it happens even when you're not even touching the can, which is what polarization means. So that's kind of cool. All right. I've got a simulation here about static electricity. Let me reset it. So if we reset it here, look at this balloon, okay? Right now, would you say the balloon is more positive charge, negative, or neutral? neutral? It's neutral. For every positive charge, it's got a negative one. So it's neutral. Now we know that we can change the charge of a balloon. We've all kind of done that before. What's going to happen if I bring the balloon over and I rub it on the sweater? What's going to happen to the charges? Make a prediction there. What's going to happen? Will it pick up the negative, the positive, or what's going to happen? Okay, so let's try it. So I'm going to grab the balloon. Now let's rub it on this on the sleeve here. What's happening? So if you look, it's taking all those negative charges, all those electrons. So let me grab all the electrons that I can. Okay, now the balloon is more what? More negative. If I was to release the balloon, I've got a hold of it right here. If I release it, which way is it going to go? Towards the shirt. Why? That's correct. Why? Because the shirt now is the sweater is positive, right? So let's try it. If I release it, you can see that it just flies right to the shirt. And that's why it stays on your shirt if, if you do that. Okay? Let's try another experiment. There's a wall. Okay, see this wall right here? The wall is electrically neutral. For every positive charge here, there's a negative one. What would happen if I brought this balloon over to the wall? Good, yeah. Let's see what happens. So the balloon is negative. What's going to happen to the negative charges in the wall? Can you see that? No. If I move it around, you can kind of see it a little better. Why are the electrons in the wall moving away? Yeah, because like charges repel each other. The balloon is negative, negatively charged. And you can see how it moves the electrons in the wall away from it. Now, what would happen if I let go? I've got a hold of it. What would happen if I let go of the balloon right here? Should we try it? What do you think would happen? Uh, maybe it'll stick. Is it going to stick? Okay, so I let go and it sticks to the wall. That's why a balloon, when you do that, it sticks to the wall. It's because of opposite charges attract each other. So the negative charges of the balloon attracted to the positive side of, or positive charges of the wall. Okay, now what if I bring it to the middle? Now, where do you think it's going to go? 
back to the shirt because there's more positive charge there. Okay, and so that's what's happening. Anyway, kind of a cool simulation. It's put on by um, put out by PHET. If you Google PHET physics simulations, there's a whole bunch that you can do, and, and kind of shows uh, what's happening in, in terms of the physics there. Okay, so let's go back to the notes. Let's go back to the notes for a second, and I've got uh, just to finish up here a video about the science of lightning. This is put on by a, a YouTube channel called SciShow. Um, if you follow them or subscribe to them, they've got a whole bunch of science uh, videos, and they explain the physics or the science behind um, different things. But they do a great job. I promise, if you watch this, pay attention. You'll learn how lightning strikes work, how, how that happens. So let's watch it. Whether it's up in the sky during a thunderstorm or helping send a DeLorean back to the future, lightning is a beautiful, dangerous phenomenon. Most people picture lightning as a brilliant white strike that flashes between a cloud and the ground. But there's also lightning within clouds and between clouds. Plus, there's colored lightning and even glowing ball lightning. It's all about a buildup of electric charge and the release of that energy in a bright flash. To have a lightning strike, you first need to separate positive and negative charges within a cloud. Clouds are essentially a bunch of really small, dust-borne ice crystals and water molecules. During a storm, the air is moving around and making these particles collide. So one theory is that some negatively charged electrons from the upward moving water molecules get transferred to the downward moving heavier particles. This makes the bottom of the storm cloud more negatively charged and the top of the storm cloud more positively charged. And remember, like charges repel each other. So the electrons near the Earth's surface are repelled away and the ground underneath the cloud is left with an overall positive charge. All this charge separation creates a strong electric field between the ground and the cloud. Basically, an electric field describes how much force and in what direction a positive charge would go if it were in the field, in this case upward toward the cloud. And when the difference in charges builds up enough, the first stage of lightning begins. Most of the time we see negative lightning. This is when the electric field grows strong enough that an invisible channel of negative charges, called a step leader, begins to branch toward the ground at about 50 meters per microsecond. Meanwhile, an upward moving channel of positive charges, called a streamer, rises up. They meet with a huge bright flash that travels up. Not to mention the heat, over 25,000 degrees Celsius, which is about five times hotter than the surface of the sun. Because the negatively charged electrons stream from the cloud down to the ground, it's called negative lightning. There's also the much less common positive lightning, with a net transfer of positive charge from the cloud to the ground instead. These strikes start at the top of a cloud where positive charges hang out, so they need to travel through much more air to reach the ground. So they need even more charge separation, which means the strikes can be up to 10 times stronger than negative lightning. In fact, these strikes can even break break apart molecules in the atmosphere into ions, which can collide with other molecules like hydrogen and oxygen, and cause photons of red light to be released. If this happens, we call them red sprites. They usually only last milliseconds, and can kind of look like giant jellyfish in the sky. And if that sounds cool, there's another type of lightning called a blue jet. This lightning occurs when large amounts of positive charge stream upward in order to neutralize the charge in the cloud. The blue jets can get up to 40 kilometers high, but only last for fractions of a second. And scientists believe their blue color comes from ionized nitrogen molecules. Even weirder is ball lightning, a glowing grapefruit-sized ball of gas that lasts up to 20 seconds. But scientists aren't quite sure what causes it. One theory suggests that ball lightning is caused by ions made by a lightning strike near glass, like a window. The ions could pile up on one side of the glass and create an electric field, exciting air molecules on the other side, which would release photons and create a glow. Another theory suggests that elements in soil are to blame. In 2012, scientists in China recorded the first video of ball lightning. They monitored the light it emitted and found that it contained silicon, iron, and calcium, which are all elements found in soil. So a cloud-to-ground lightning strike might vaporize the soil's silicate compounds, which react with the surrounding atmosphere to produce a ball of light. So, the next time you're watching a thunderstorm from the warm, dry safety of your home, remember that all this lightning has a lot of physics behind it. Beautiful, dangerous physics. Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow, brought to you by our patrons on Patreon. If you want to help support the show, just go to patreon.com slash scishow, and don't forget to go to youtube.com slash scishow and subscribe. Okay, so uh, he kind of talked a lot about different kinds of lightning, but I wanted to focus and make sure that we kind of understood the most common type of lightning, which he called negative lightning. So if we uh, draw a picture of what was happening there, hopefully you kind of understood. So in a storm, there's a bunch of clouds, there's a bunch of energy, right? 
there's uh, dust particles in the clouds that are coming down because they're more dense. The, the water molecules are traveling up. And he said that there was a transfer of electrons there. And that the electrons would build up on the bottom side of the cloud. That means the top of the cloud was positively charged. Okay. Well, it's kind of like polarization when we looked at this before with the, with the balloon and the can. And so if you have, if, now we have the ground. Let's draw the ground down here, maybe. Okay, so here's the ground. Now when a lightning, um, when a lightning storm happens and lightning actually strikes, what happens is the ground, most of the time the ground is neutral. So for every positive charge, there's a negative charge. But just like with the balloon and the can, when, you, when it gets enough electric uh, charge build up here, the negative charges in the cloud can push away the negative charges on the ground. Whoops. Uh-oh. Okay, so what I was trying to say is the negative charges of, the blo of, this, of this cloud now are going to push away the negative charges in the ground, and so the ground is going to be positive. Well, when that happens in this, and there's enough electrical energy available, there's a big enough charge built up here between the cloud and the ground, you can see a lightning strike. Okay? And so let's talk about lightning safety for a second. If you're in a thunderstorm, where's the best place or the safest place to be? In a tall tree. <laughs> Maybe we should talk about where you shouldn't go. If you're, out in the, if you're out in the woods, where should you not hang out? By the tallest tree, right? A lot of people think, well, I'm under the tree. It protects me from the rain. But this lightning bolt is most likely going to strike the tallest object in that area. So you don't want to be standing under a tree. There's so much electricity in the lightning strike that it, even though it strikes the tree, it's going to spread out to you and, um, and it will do some damage. So usually you want to find some low-lying area Inside a house is best, inside a car, but don't hang out underneath tall objects, especially if they're metal. So, um, all right, hopefully that kind of makes sense and you understand a little bit more about the physics of lightning. Okay, to finish up, we're gonna just have some fun now with these different um, experiments. We have a Van de Graaff generator set up in the back. We've got the, the, the can and the balloon demonstration here. And I've also got some electroscopes, guys. And I'll show you how they work, but we can charge different pieces of tape with opposite charges or similar charges and show how opposite charges will attract and similar charges will repel. Okay, that's it for chapter six. Um, there's really nothing left in this chapter. Hopefully we learned something and we understand a little bit better about gravity, about electricity, about tides, about static electricity. And hopefully you learn something.